Hello and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Caleb from the Blandco channel and today we're going to be talking about independent material for D&D 5e. I'm here with my special guest. Sir, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Hi, my name is Aviad Tal. I'm the lead designer of Beyond the Screen Studio. Uh, we create 5e adventures in the world of Eleanor and I also create YouTube videos on Beyond the Screen uh, YouTube channel. Yes, and I wanted to talk to you today because, uh, it, you know, there's pretty much a correct way to doing um, independent stuff for D&D, and I have literally just dipped my toe into this. So I have put something up on the Dungeon Masters Guild, uh, and that's pretty much it. And you pretty much have like a... Your stuff looks very slick. It's, it's, oh, you, have you. The, you have the artwork... You have a professional website that showcases all of your stuff, and it seems like you're doing everything. It seems like you're doing it in the most professional manner possible if you're completely independent. Uh, well, thank you first, first and foremost for all the compliments. I do think there is more than one way of doing it, and I see it around as, as well, like uh, on on you know other uh, creators and studios doing it, but uh, there are a lot of similarities between the studios that succeed. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to share everything I've learned in the past, I guess, well, two, two years probably doing like publishing things. Um, so yes, I currently, the way I publish stuff is uh, via either Patreon uh, which is kind of an early access for people who want to see the content first. And then like three or four or sometimes more uh, months afterwards, content goes up on drive through RPG where anyone can buy it. Yeah, that's that's the big thing. Um, and then Wally DM also puts his stuff all up on uh, drive through RPG as well. He's another creator that I know of uh, that has done successful stuff. Now, the, as far as I know, there's lots of advantages to using drive-through RPG. Uh, I think the biggest one uh, that I've been made aware of is the actual ability to make a printed product later down the line. And I know there's also some less restrictions when you compare that to like the Dungeon Masters Guild. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, the main difference that I know of there's there are two contracts essentially that you have to choose from. Uh, the M's Guild contract allows you to use more of D&D's uh, trademark. Um, so you can actually use content for, say, like create adventures for Eberron or Ravenloft or any of their, you know, um, trademark uh, settings. Um, you can't do that on drive through RPG. On the other hand, when you upload stuff to drive through RPG, you keep the rights to them. Mm -hmm. which is not the case when you upload it to DMs Guild. So yeah. you can you cannot sell it to anywhere else once you uploaded it to DMs Guild. And theoretically speaking, um, you are not the owner of the, you know, the, you don't have the copyright for the things you wrote, um, which can be a bit of a problem if you're aiming to be a publisher in the long run and you want to use that content and, um, you know, base other prog products on everything you have created, this is a lot more difficult when you're working through the M's Guild. Yes. Also, I ran into a thing when I published mine. Apparently, in the DMs Guild, you can't use anything that looks like branded, um, branded identifiers on the cover. Uh, which I'm assuming that's that's probably not the case for Drive Through RPG because I used the the name of my YouTube channel, Blandco. And it actually got rejected for the. I did a uh, a small, I did a small collection of magical items, and uh, so I basically just made a PDF. And because I used the name of my YouTube channel on the cover, that was rejected. And I'm assuming that probably wouldn't be the case for Drive Through RPG. Yeah. Um, so it's actually there's a there's a weird kind of twilight zone in drive through RPG, something you need to, to be aware of when you start publishing. Uh, there are two ways that you can publish things on drive through You can do that with a publisher account or with a fan community content, I think. Community content, I think it's called. And if you do that with community content, then you actually will have some restrictions on the, on the, you know, on the title, on the cover, like you've ran into. 
But if you go and create a full publisher account, you can have pretty much any branding you want. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's a bit more overhead to open a publisher account, but really not, not a big deal, especially if you plan on, on, you know, posting more than one title up there. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I did stuff on the Dungeons & Masters Guild kind of just as a test, you know? Uh, not really anything that serious or... But, like, as I'm putting work into... I basically am considering publishing a dungeon crawl that I've done that I've run for new D&D players for, you know, I, countless times. I've run it at libraries, uh, comic book shops, game shops, uh, conventions... And I really want to, like, fully write it out and release it to the public. But I'm really considering what options I have for that. And I really don't want to use <laughs> the Dungeon Master's Guild just because it's something that I put so much work into. And the idea of just giving up my rights to it is just... it. I would almost rather just, like, put it out as a PDF. Uh, maybe using Patreon, because that's that's something you implement as well, which is successfully used by a lot of people and yeah i i regret not putting more work into mine but uh yeah i mean the only the only custom content i have on mine is like the um the weird like custom D D monsters that i've come up with throughout the years and i've only like done proper write-ups of like three of them so there's not much motivation for people to use my patreon for that uh, and i think that's something i need to work on in the future um, yeah, but I mean, you can always add more things that Patreon patrons get when they um, when they sign up, and you know, improve the deal for anyone who's considering. That's I feel like the strongest um, uh, kind of model for Patreon today is making a deal they cannot refuse. Yeah, uh, for, you for see example, that a lot. Uh, Black Magic yeah. Craft uses uh, who's a big channel. Who, uh, who is a big fan of mine. Uh, he uses his Patreon, and anybody who subscribes at the $1 level gets access to his Discord, which yeah. is a really great Discord because he just filled with people making, like, interesting crafts for D&D. So, I mean, that's, you know, that is something that is uh, a draw for his Patreon to be able to get access to the Discord and uh, be able to see all the cool stuff people are doing. Absolutely. And when you take into account creators uh, like uh, Chesley and Peku or DM Dave or, you know, people who've been, who've been doing that for, for quite a while, uh, they have collected like a vote of hundreds of, in Chesley and Peku's uh, um, like case, it's maps and in, for DM Dave's it's adventures. But either way, when you sign up, you get so many things. Um, and you see that you see that they are successful because they're doing that. Uh, so absolutely, there's like you can always make the uh, the proposition the the a bit better for patrons. Um, and I keep trying to do that with everything I create. Yeah, well, you you just build up, in which which I should have been doing from the beginning, but I just didn't I just didn't think of it. Like, all this stuff that I have, I have the rough drafts of all this stuff, and if I just cleaned it up a little bit, like, that would be a really fun resource for somebody else, but, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a bit of work to, to bring it up to the, uh, to the um, level of polished material that we are used to see for 5th uh, edition content. You know, oh. there's a lot. There's so many... Uh, um, you know, new with like publishers uh, and on Kickstarters mm -hmm. and all that that created no, the not most once. beautiful. Did you? Yes. Did you see? Yeah. Did you? I that's saw it. Crazy. Sinclair's. Is, uh, uh, what was it called? Sinclair's Almanac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so cool. He does yeah, that he, for Pathfinder and D and D. Yes, and, and it's just like he. He's somebody I think a lot of people would consider like, oh, he's a smaller niche Pathfinder YouTuber. But he's created such a um, a big digital footprint because, like, a lot of people know who he is, uh, and he's able to create like a professional looking uh, Kickstarter like that, and to put out like something that has obviously people find real value in because, like, it was hugely successful. Yeah, and I mean, even though he is smaller than some 
D and D YouTubers that we see out there. When it comes to Pathfinder Second Edition, I don't think there's any YouTuber that's, that's uh, really creating more content than he does. I'm maybe I'm wrong. Correct me. You might correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think there but, might be like uh, I'm not an expert in Pathfinder stuff, but I think the I think it says a lot that I'm not an expert in Pathfinder stuff. Yeah, I know exactly who No Nat Ones is, and yeah, I'm subscribed exactly. to his channel and I follow him on Twitter and stuff. It's... And if you are a Pathfinder 2 fan, you will know him uh, as a GM that wants to expand their knowledge specifically for that system. Um, so I think there's a lot of appeal to being like one of the, the leading, um, you know, in, in your own niche. All right. And the other thing I wanted to touch on too, the big thing for years, I was told, don't do this don't do this. You don't need a website anymore. And hmm. this was hammered into me, both in school and in just regular things. And that is not the case anymore. Obviously, Beyond the Screen has a beautiful website and it, all the information is, is there. I'm assuming you... Um, um, actually, it, 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 like we have a Patreon page and a Facebook page and a YouTube page. I don't have I don't have a website well, yet. What was I looking at then? I don't, uh, I'm you, not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, you have the uh, you have the link sh sheet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. have uh, the Willow. Yeah, it's called Willow Links, I think. Yeah, with all the links. Yeah, that's very useful just to have everything uh, in one place. It's not like a full-on website. This is actually something I'm I'm working on because you know Patreon's nice, YouTube's nice, all of them are cool. But if I want to sell my content or merchandise i can't do that no wait a second uh, no you do have a landing page i have a landing yeah page that's what to... i'm talking about when i say uh, well when i say you don't need a website <laughs> and then you okay. have this this landing page for your email sign up that is what right I'm, you tried to yes. fool me you tried to fool me i was like wait a minute <laughs> am i am i going insane i just checked this yesterday i know he has a landing page <laughs> It's a landing page for the mailing list. Yes. Um, well, yes, I, I guess it's it's a website in the broad sense. I, yeah, you know what? Fine. Yeah, I tried to deceive you, Caleb. Yes. You saw it right through me. I know. You can't. Uh, I'm I too apologize. sharp for this, sir. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, the, uh, the landing, that's exactly the sort of thing that people were trying to say don't do. They say just have your social medias, just have your uh, various websites where you put up content, and don't have any kind of like... But, but like I said, you not only have that, you have the links sheet and stuff like that, so people can easily find all your stuff. And right. it, it's just like that's something that you think, I think you need to have. Absolutely. Um, when you start doing this, you are your only uh, fan, essentially, when you start, right? There is no one, no one knows what you're doing, no one knows how good it is, and you need to convince people to check out your stuff because there's so much out there. And if you don't do it consistently, if you don't make it easy for them to find your content, they just won't. Um, so making it as easy as possible, making it uh, beautiful and, and you know attractive, uh, talking about it and, and um, essentially self-promoting when you can is the only way to move up in the tabletop RPG industry. Yeah, it's it's very weird too because uh, again, this was the bad advice that people gave me back in, you know, 2012 or whatever. It's just like, you know, don't don't have uh sites on everything. Like have something where you focus all your effort on one thing, which is just like now it's now it's the complete opposite. I mean, I have I have a Facebook site where I have like almost like a completely different audience than I have for my YouTube thing and I have like 11,000 subscribers on Facebook and they're they're mostly there for like shared D&D &D, like image content and stuff and they'll they'll click on a video that I share um <laughs> you got to do the thing where you have a still image and then have the link to a YouTube video cuz Facebook right. won't show people <laughs> they pay, if true. you have if you just have the external link and that's the deal for all these websites which is a hilarious convoluted mess but it's just really interesting that I have like a completely different audience on Facebook than I do for YouTube, and there is crossover. It's, it's, yeah. But yeah, it's just it's it's fascinating. Some of them stuff. will 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 be in both. 
So you'll probably have a good amount of people that are both Facebook uh, followers and YouTube subscribers. Um, but still, each of these platforms has a different role in in your uh, strategy, essentially. Yeah. Uh, a Facebook has a different, uh, you know, you, you can add posts which um, with more text and people tend to read a bit, a bit more on Facebook. Uh, well, on YouTube, I mean, you do have YouTube uh, community tab um, available, but I don't think it is, people it read is, long things in there. It, it, exactly. For example, like for a while there, uh, if you did a poll, like I, I saw a video where it's like, oh, if you do a poll, you'll get a lot more like interaction. So like a while there, I, uh, I posted a poll and literally I would have like 300, 400 people like answer the poll. That's but like, but like, I would only get a hundred likes or something, and I would sometimes even less than that. And yeah. so it's just it's so weird how like, for some reason, YouTube is just it, it just doesn't work exactly the way you assume it would. So like, a poll every once in a while in your community tab will interest people a lot, and then mm -hmm. other content like apparently they just don't even see it somehow. Yes. Um... Exactly. And th every social media has that little, you know, some things that work better than others. And you kind of need to learn and adjust, not just copy one post from one place to the other, but kind of adjust if you want them to to actually get traction and succeed. Uh, not that I'm a social media expert by no means. Uh, I It's definitely a field that I can get better at, especially um, when, when discussing consistency. Uh, but uh, um, I yeah. have learned some of the strengths of each of them. Uh, like, for example, having a Discord server is the best place to interact with people um, because you can answer them instantly or even after a while and it will ping them and it's a, com a discussion they are interested in as opposed to YouTube, um, like YouTube community tabs where people don't really leave comments or at all um so yeah uh, it's it is really interesting that um on how i want to describe this the discord thing is is again wild because like i am uh i have i have not really ever promoted my discord but every once in a while i'll share the link and like i have like a lot of people in there now so that's just something I need to just remember, like you said, consistency, actually allowing people to know that I have a Discord and whatnot would be very helpful. <laughs> and if you're listening to this podcast, then you know now that Caleb has a Discord server and you need to go and sign in. You know what? I might actually <laughs> share the Discord link in the description. <laughs> that might actually be helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you see, that's that's just one other example. Um, but yes, having that social media, um, you know, aligned and, um, maintained is very, very important. Um, and actually, you know, I've heard the opposite advice when I started, like, um, not to the opposite to what I just said, but the opposite to what you have gotten from others. Like I, I was told that having a mailing list is still the most important thing that you can do as a, as a publisher. And I went like, but that's like, who, who uses mailing lists these days? Like, I'm not on any mailing lists. Um, but I was proven wrong. And I then like, you know, I've, I've spoke with a few publishers, with a few people uh, running Kickstarters, including a good friend of mine, uh, Amit Moshe, that, uh, you know, he's the creator of City of Mist and... Uh, creating many more Kickstarter projects. And he told me, like, a lot of people show up to the Kickstarter because they're on the mailing list. Um, and that's huge. I, Still. I have heard about that as well. And it's just like, you don't, you don't really realize that. But like, in my work, I'm on a bunch of public library mailing lists. And like, honestly, yeah, that's how I found out about the D&D game that I'm running right now <laughs> is from a mailing list. But you just sort of associate that with work stuff and you don't really realize, oh wait, like everybody is absolutely 
deluged by stuff on social media. And so because everyone's emails have gotten somewhat a little bit better um, at, like, weeding out spam stuff, an email mailing list actually would be, like, a really easy and convenient way to get updates on something that you're very interested in. Because unlike social media, your your mail people's mailboxes are no longer, like, just destroyed every single day in terms of, like, the amount of mail that you get. Yeah. Because you have all the blocks for it, like all the, you know, you have the promotion tab and, and spam blockers and everything in place. So like you've said, uh, you have a lot more control on what you're seeing in your email. Yeah. So yeah, still, still strong. So if you're out there uh, trying to create content for and publishing, start your emailing list yesterday. Yeah, I, I am going to be starting an email list and I'm going to be starting a basic website um, soon. And, uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. I actually had like pretty huge success with like blogs and stuff back in the day. And mm. I didn't realize like, you know, there's, there's still people reading those blogs and everything. Uh, that was for, that was for like video game stuff. Uh, when I did content for the Dreamcast junkyard. Um, but they still have quite a few people that are interested in their podcast and, and their 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 blog website is basically like the the big draw and yeah. some of the numbers on that were just very interesting it's just like it's it's weird to think that like despite all like the D&D content I've put out I might still actually still be more remembered in in internet history for the articles I did on the Sega Dreamcast That's interesting I mean well first off uh um you're still going right you never Oh know. yeah yeah uh, but yes, uh, you know, I've learned that my experience with social media is no indicator for the average use case. So yes, I don't go into blogs very often. I, I do read some articles on Noms to you every once in a while, um, but not really a blog person overall. And yet a lot of people are. Just as they open, just as they go on mailing lists and and do other things that I don't, that doesn't mean they won't like my content just because we don't have the same social media pattern. Uh, so one quick question: uh, of all your content, I mean, what do you think your most favorite content that you've put out is in terms of? I'm assuming it's probably one of the things that you've written. It yeah. Um. You know, I do I do stuff and I'm, I do videos on YouTube and I and I write a lot of stuff, but I'm I feel a lot more fulfilled from my writing than I do anything else. Um, there are a few things I'm trying to kind of figure out which one is the, <laughs> my favorite. I, I um, would say if it was me, I would have to say your compendium for magical items. That ooh. that seems pretty cool. It was, it was. Actually, uh, that's that's a strong contender there. I think, though, one of my favorites um, is an adventure that I've published a few... Well, I published it on Patreon nearly six months ago, but it went up on drive Through RPG only, um, I think, maybe three weeks ago. Um, it's called Trials of the Spirit Walker. And... It's a seventh level adventure where the characters uh, explore this mystery and go into the ethereal plane, which we don't see a lot of in other forms of media. Um, and they have to kind of make some choices, some difficult choices. And I like it because it has a combination of mystery, uh, in, uh, interesting riddles, um, compelling characters. I've actually added like an appendix for the characters in the in the supplement so uh, GMs can read them before they start playing to get into the mindset of the character. I, I love I love subsections like that. I forget um, I don't I don't know what the official term is, but when you have like after before the monster manual you have like the the persons of note. If this was an old Warhammer fantasy RPG thing it would be persons of note and you'd have like the little illustration and the write up description of like what the character who the character yeah. is and what their goals are and stuff. 
so so I've, I've put some effort into that because the characters are very important in that one um and also like it's really um intrinsic i feel to the world that i that i have been um developing throughout everything we wrote so so like the adventures and supplements and all the collections uh, are all part of the same world um some of them can be easily torn apart and used in any fantasy game but when put together they create a very unique world with some conflicts that personally i didn't see in any other D&D setting i did see them in some books and some other video games um but i've never seen encountered them in D&D and those are quite interesting um for example one of the main uh, kind of concepts in the world is that memories and emotions are magic they can manifest spirits uh so for example a child that um is sleeping in bed and has nightmares and thinks there's a monster in the closet might actually conjure a spirit of fear because he imagines it and because he's afraid um and, and that i took that concept that, and and have implemented it everywhere in the world um and that has brought some interesting conflicts that you know you just don't see elsewhere yeah it's it I really want to do like more like complex stuff, like cause and effect stuff, and it's just I'm having uh, difficulty writing that out. But just having like a just solid concepts like that uh, in your in your works is just something that like I think a lot of people really appreciate. Um, and also too, the artwork is amazing. Ah, uh, yeah, it really is. Um, so some of it is um, stock art which means that uh, you know you can get a license to and use uh, for relatively cheap um, like um, maybe you know a few bucks maybe 10 or 20 bucks for some of them and you can just use them whenever um, a good name to save is Dean Spencer uh, he has a great patreon where he does a lot of that um, but some of them I'm very happy to say that uh, I I was able to afford some illustrator commissions um, for the covers and let me tell you that seeing the covers being made from something I imagined is one of the best experiences and <laughs> rewards for me um, as a writer. It's just so much, I, I, can't, I can't even, you know, it's so much fun seeing them working on it, uh, taking what I the the what I wrote for them the prompts and turning them into this magical uh, um, thing that I can see. I don't know. It sounds. I'm I'm a bit flustered now, but you know. No, it's, it's just the, 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 if anybody is not, I'll I'll leave the link for the drive through RPG for the trials of the Spirit Walker. But the cover for that one is really amazing. Yeah, that cover. Is actually a stock art. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh. Um, when I started, you know how I, I went, you know, I started without any money doing this, and I was adamant of, about not spending too much before I see anything. Um, so I actually w went the other way around. I started from the art, mm -hmm. I found artwork that was cool, and then I tried to build an adventure that works with that art. Um, and that actually inspired some ideas because uh, limitations breed creativity. So, yeah. And then, you know, once you're done, you already have the cover, which is awesome. Yes, I, I, I've commissioned only one. I've commissioned a bunch of uh, art for the YouTube channel uh, from my friend who is my friend from the UK, who's actually a friend from back in the, uh, the Dreamcast uh, video game content days. Uh, uh, animated Aaron Foster who makes amazing artwork that's just like I, I don't even know who else would do like cartoony artwork like that but he does like really amazing like cartoony stuff if anybody's seen like the illustration of my owl bear uh, he's the one who did that and uh, oh. he's done like I, I think the best stuff he's done is like the uh, uh, the I did a video on like traps and he just did some really great cartoony stuff for like uh, anyways, uh, I will have to, 
You'll just have to look at my uh, video about traps for that. But uh, the, yeah. you know, it's it's just it, it really is amazing. But you're right. Sometimes you can't <laughs> you can't start off with custom artwork. Like the only reason I have access to that is because you know we're friends from back in the day. So right. not everybody's going to be friends with a very talented uh, UK artist. So. Yeah, and it's not just art. You know, there's so much in there. There's layout mm -hmm. um, and writing and yeah, what, what do you Yeah, uh, what do you use? Now, I used a cobbed up system because I don't have... I, I currently don't have Adobe Illustrator. I, I use, I've I used Adobe, Adobe Illustrator in the distant past. But uh, so... Uh, and I kind of use like just a cob... I use like Google Docs, Word, and then uh, a free template. So what, mm -hmm. what do you, you use for your layout? So I do layout with uh, Affinity Publisher. I have the Affinity Suite. It's a one-time purchase. Some of the best money I spend uh, on the business is buying license for those. The, it's excellent. It's uh, very similar to InDesign, but without the monthly payment. Yeah, that's the big thing that I can't... I just, just let me pay for Adobe Premiere, and I will gladly pay a massive right? price, but they won't let you do it. So yep. now, literally, I'm learning how to use um, DaVinci Resolve, just Same. because, just because I, I don't, I absolutely, I'm reaching my limit of what I can do with uh, the Premiere elements, which is what I usually use. Because, like, you know, I don't really need fancy editing, but at the same time, like, I, I would love to use Adobe Premiere. I used Adobe Premiere, and I actually created like DVDs and stuff. And back in college, where I did, by if anybody's wondering why there's weird skit comedy on some of my earlier videos, uh, and I used Adobe Premiere to do that, and it was a great tool. But it's just like I don't want to pay a monthly thing. Like just exactly. have me pay, have me pay a, a, a large amount of money. I will gladly do that now, and I really wish I would have gotten. Yeah. Yep. You know, when I was a student, it was a lot easier being an Adobe subscriber, but now that I'm not, yeah, Affinity uh, Publisher is probably the answer for that. And, you know, layout has, I, I always improve. There's all, there's so much to learn in this. It's, it's an, it's a whole world of design and layout. Oh, and, I forget uh, the name of the, uh, um, yeah. the indestructible, I always forget his screen name. But the uh, the guy did a video, indestructible DM or something like that. He did uh, he did an amazing and like I mean an absolutely amazing tutorial for um, for for creating like the, the the templates for a project like this. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting. And I want to make sure I can. I'm gonna vamp for time while I look up his screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it if you, you know, throw a link in the description as well. Uh, that way, we we kind of as as we progress in the in the podcast, we get more and more people, more and more, uh, you know, tips and videos and and homework <laughs> for any publisher that might listen. Um, yes, but Affinity was great, but also you know. There is edit. That, that's just one aspect. Um, writing is a big thing, and yeah. if you if you can write everything on your own, that's that's amazing and great. But also, you need to write in a specific way. You can't just write it like you write a novel or an article. There is a, a structure um, that that people use for adventures, and um, even if you don't plan on using that structure, you kind of need to understand it so you know what they expect, and then deconstruct it and do whatever you want. Um, yeah. But that's one thing. And also edit it. Like editing your own stuff is difficult. And often you will miss the things that you um, that you missed in the first place because exactly. you're the same person. That's why so editors have, exist. Yeah. Even um, for, even for the some of the best writers, uh, that's why editors exist. I'd argue that the best writers use the best editors. Mm. Um, and, you know... Without an editor, there is there is so much as just being missed, um, and there's also playtesting that becomes more and more important the more you stray from the um, player's handbook and and you know the other official stuff. 
uh, it's publishing is is no longer just writing something and posting it online. It it became this. Um, it's it's a job. It's yeah. a it's a real. That, that's why uh, I've expanded into into a studio, hiring more people, um, more writers, more like an editor. Um, doing what I can to become more and more professional um, because there's a demand for professional content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Indestructiboy uh, had that video on formatting uh, projects for D&D uh, &D, uh, and it was just he did a really good in-depth video uh, and his a lot of this stuff too is about balancing in-game mm -hmm. which is something that I have seen... <laughs> <laughs> One of my vlogs that I did is I talked about a uh, a module that got like widespread physical release in stores in the U.S. and that thing was the absolutely worst edited and the absolutely like it had no balance at all. It was awful, but it looked slick. The design, the artwork, everything made it look like a professional product. But, like, one character had, like, 20s for all of their stats. <laughs> uh, there was, like... I, I broke down the monster that they had for, like, level 1 characters. And it literally was, like... It was, like, this thing that had, like, the equivalent of, like, 300 hit points that could attack, like, six times around. Oh, wow. And it's just like one of the comments from the Amazon review is like, this person has no idea what action economy is. <laughs> yep. And it's just like, and what happened is uh, I had experienced that because some new DM found that. And because it looked good, they tried to run it. And like characters started like just getting wiped out within like the first like 10 minutes of play. Uh, and it's supposed to be a dungeon crawl where there's no long rest. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's just what it just happens when people prioritize it looking good. It's so it's such a mess because you have you absolutely have to have a product that looks good for it to be printed and published it and people see it. But then they will be disappointed if you don't play test it and the quality isn't good. Yeah, exactly. So, it's just uh yeah, yeah. no no play testing because i refuse to believe if he actually number one the characters like were all level one but they were literally like characters that all had like a minimum of like a 20 for one of their stats and they were all like the most ridiculously overpowered level one characters ever like every single one of them had like a, a magical item and it was just <laughs> the entire people seem to under, misunderstand the point of level one now nowadays like there's been the overcorrection where everybody's like oh you have to run a level zero adventure but like mm -hmm. kind of the point of level one characters that is that it's simple enough where people kind of understand what their character can do and there's not it yeah. gets it gets more complex as you go up in levels Exactly. But, it's, yeah. it's an introduction to the system. Exactly. And back in the day, it used to be like, oh, you had to start all your games with level three. And this was like five years ago, I want to say. Because like there was a bunch of podcasts that would only start their characters at level three. And I'm not talking about the major ones. Uh, I'm talking about um, a lot of the smaller podcasts, too. And uh, there was this weird idea that like, you had to start out the adventure at level three, and then it was just it was a it was a little bit of a thing. And now I think there's a kind of a bit of an overcorrection where a level zero thing can be very helpful, uh, especially if you have brand new players. But there's still a lot to be said about just having a level one uh, game that's properly balanced. Yeah. Um. Because yeah, again, like you're going to. A lot of people say, oh, well, 5e is just so deadly. It's just like, well, yeah, because you, you can start introducing your players into those mechanics. It doesn't necessarily have to be like uh, an ogre, you know, outright killing somebody with massive damage. Like, you know, right. they, they need to learn about stuff like healing, you know, death saves and stuff like that. So, yep, absolutely. It's um, 
It's... I, you know, I understand why people might want to start on third level because that, this is when you get all your character abilities, yeah. the subclasses and stuff. But I think even for a podcast, like if you want to bring people who have never seen D&D before, have never heard of it, have never played, then starting from level one makes more sense because they will learn the game mechanics along with the players. Mm. Um, but that's just my take on it. I don't know. I'm, I've never had a podcast or, you know, a live play going on. So it's just my uneducated opinion. Yeah, I have I love D&D podcasts when they're at the lower levels. And then I lose interest <laughs> as they get more into it. Uh, because it's just, it's just more interesting to me to listen to, like, low-level play. Of, and I think by the very nature, it's like, they're a little bit more creative uh, and then once they get into higher levels it becomes more about like what their abilities can do and less about what like what they can do creatively with those abilities but that's another podcast entirely yeah <laughs> um and okay. uh yeah uh so i think we can wrap up now uh is there anything else you uh, want to touch on before we end our discussion on independent stuff i think we talked a lot about very interesting yeah. topics i think this will be a helpful podcast for anybody who's interested in getting to learn some of the basics about uh what's going on with independent D stuff absolutely and i and i do have some a few more things to say uh if you want to start publishing first off know that it takes time it can take a few years um to start seeing anything out of this, not to mention going full time. Very few people I know of go full time. I don't go full. T I didn't go full time yet, and I don't know when when it's going to happen. Uh, it requires that you trust yourself and be patient and give yourself some some leeway and uh, and you know um, make mistakes and and learn from them. You'll have to adapt uh, and learn what what works best for you and what programs are best, what people are best for you to work with, um, and get over that barrier of advertising yourself, because I know how difficult that is when you start. Um, but that's really the only way to go to go about it. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out to other people who have already done it or, you know, you want to work with. Uh, we often look for, for more people to, you know, start um branching out and getting some xp uh, as a writer when you start off working with someone with experience can be very very helpful when you go on and then create your own thing um so i hope some some of these uh you know pieces of advice are helpful and you go and do it and be awesome yeah okay? yeah and i want to i want to say something very pessimistic here and say you should be doing projects like this because uh, you want to and you're going to be excited about seeing the project. You should not get into this because you assume that, like, oh, you're going to get the respect of all these people and all this other stuff. Uh, if if you were excited, if you, if you remember just a while back uh, and you heard uh, my guest talking about how excited he was to see how uh his project ended up like that's really what you need if you're going to be doing creation stuff if you're going to be doing creative work like that you need to be excited about the final product uh and you need to be you need to make something that you're excited about and if you are doing something and you're just kind of going through the motions then you really need to reconsider what you're doing and that's what i've been uh working with lately <laughs> with some of my projects uh just trying to remember like why I, I make stuff and it certainly isn't to uh, make stuff that like other people are making or that uh, other people will you know I want to make stuff that I'd be interested in watching and seeing so all right then well I think we're gonna uh, end this conversation uh, I will leave links below for beyond the screen uh, by the way I love the I love the icon yeah uh, new logo yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very good logo. Uh, and I'll leave the links to be on the screen in the links below. I want to say thanks again to my guest from beyond so the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Caleb. It was a pleasure.
Uh, yes, no. I think it was going to be. I think it was a very informative podcast, and I hope everybody appreciates uh, you taking your time to talk about independent D and D. And I will see you next time when we talk about new developments in Dungeons and Dragons.